Thank you so much for coming to check out the Stash Cast, where we have interesting conversations with interesting people focused on the world of commercial real estate and prop tech. The Stash Cast is brought to you by Needle. What if you could use data and analytics to predict real estate transactions before they occur? You can with Needle. All right. So today I've got a special guest. Kevin Harness is with us. And Kevin, why don't you give the people an idea of who you are and what you do? Yes, my name is Kevin, and I wear several hats. I'm a, I'm a founder and CEO of, a, of an ed tech startup. Uh, I'm also the lead for a founder community here in, in Cincinnati, uh, and I'm also a business development account executive for Intrepid Finance. So I wear several different hats, and uh, I love them all, and they all kind of interconnect with each other as well. So it might sound a lot, but everything is path towards contributing to one another. So it's it's been great. I've only been with Intrepid for about four, four or five weeks now. So still getting into the flow of that. But the, the startup community, Founders of the Foundry has been growing. We've had some events and, and engage with the, my ed tech company it is pivoting currently, but we have a great roadmap ahead of us. And we're really excited about that. So very excited about the conversation. Yeah. It sounds like you and I share a similarity in that we're doing a lot of different things, but they're all contributing or sharing similar veins, you might say. Uh, like I've got Needle, I've got Brokerage, I'm doing a development deal, and and now the podcast is to, to support Needle. And just because I like it, it's fun. How did you decide to, how did the idea of a an ed tech company come to you? Sure. So I'm not an educator. I've never been a teacher or anything like that. I started my career actually in Chicago on the trading floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. So if you think like trading places, the movie, that's what I was doing in the open outcry pits for, for 10 years. It got to the point, I was on the brokerage side, I was on the trading side, and it got to the point to where I, was, I wasn't I was happy with where my career was going in terms of my contribution to society, basically. And I've always had this interest in startup communities, startups in general, and that that whole journey. And really through that, I just started reading because when we were in college, I believe we graduated around the same time in the yeah. mid 2000s. And there wasn't like an entrepreneurship major or anything like that, at least not at my school, Georgetown College. But since then, entrepreneurship as in terms of learning about it in the startup world um, has really exploded in, in universities being a, a phenomenal case there with their 1819 project. But around 2017, uh, I met someone who was he was a startup founder. He was building uh, an ed tech platform using AI technology. Uh, so he was ahead of his time. And I just wanted to work with the startup. The fact that it was in education, I was like, yeah, let's jump in. Um, started working with him and really took on the education as a business, education as something outside the classroom, as an observer from the outside looking in, and really fell in love with the problem of how do we improve education and how do we support teachers in general? So really, that was my first exposure to being involved in a startup on the day-to-day from a consulting standpoint, things like that. That company didn't work out, and and we we went our separate ways. But the great thing about that was I met my co-founder currently at Engage With through engaging with that company. And we really enjoyed ideating around education. So we would have Zoom conferences just like we're having right now. And we would really discuss those problems in education, what we learned from the previous startup we were in. Um, And we we landed on a a spot where it's educator development. We really wanted to to embrace educator development. Uh, A lot of teachers are leaving the classroom or the profession in those first three years. And we wanted to support that. We wanted to help teachers grow and get past those initial hurdles when they get into their, when they launch their career. We, we had a great idea and then 2020 came around and COVID hit. I know it was, you know, traumatic for everybody, but it, in terms of education and everybody knows this, but it reset everything. So it was just like a massive reset button. So what we had, we pretty much just crumbled it up and, and threw it out. Not that it wasn't a good idea, but the entire landscape was changing. The, the entire yeah. environment was changing. So we took that time to learn what the situation was, just like everybody else was doing, not in terms of COVID, but in terms of what's the new landscape coming out of this. When we come out of this, there's a great opportunity to make some adjustments in education that's been talked about, but never really implemented. And we thought that EdTech's been around for, for many years, but 
it's really just been digitizing certain things within education. The grade book is a, is a great example. There's tons of grade book software out there, but it's just digitizing the classroom experience for each kind of iteration. So we wanted to go beyond that. And we thought EdTech hasn't really delivered on what it's promised, right? It's just really just digitizing the experience in those kind of small little verticals. Um, so we started to, our entry was educator development in terms of going into colleges of education and helping student teachers during their student teaching process. So we built out our platform and we, we piloted with a local university here in Cincinnati. And really what we learned was students, especially at colleges of ed, it was really about checking boxes. Like I did my lesson plan and I, I observed these hours. It was, there, there wasn't a lot of engagement involved in it. But when we moved into those first year educators where they're alone in their classroom and they're running the show, that's where we wanted to you know, embrace this mentorship development and this mentorship platform. And that's where we landed coming out. And now we're launching into it. Like I said, we had a pilot, successful pilot. Now we're pivoting to be more of those novice teachers and matching mentor teachers into that environment. So it's been a, it's been a whirlwind getting into education, leaving that first company because it's, it's just the way it is in the startup world. Things don't work out sometimes. And then going back into it immediately as a founder, let's start from ground one for, or from ground zero and really start to build something out. So it's been an incredible journey with an incredible team. And we're really excited with what's coming ahead. So it sounds like you were able to take some of those learnings from the first experience. And then are you, I guess you're applying those to this next venture. Is that correct? Yeah, that's definitely fair to say because you can read, there, there's tons of literature out there on startups, startup communities, the lean model, business models, all that stuff. You could read for years on this stuff, but until you actually jump in and do it, you you really don't have any idea. That's what like a lot, a lot of founders go the accelerator route and they come out of it. I talked to a founder just the other day he's, and his, his company's doing very well. And they went to an accelerator and he asked himself, he's, if we didn't do this accelerator program, would we still be where we're at today? And he believed he was. And he's like, the, the time we spent, it was valuable, but it was really theory-based. It was like go-to-market strategy or what's your ideal customer profile and things like that in the teaching realm. Like you're almost getting your MBA at some of these accelerators, which, which has its place. But at the same time, you want to be active in your business. You want to be progressing towards goals and milestones. And sometimes accelerators don't, don't actually accomplish that. And he actually, they, they made an investment. He actually bought that investment out after they went to had the success that they had. So it's very interesting. And, and really the best way to get into the startup world and learn about startups is just to jump in, just absolutely jump in. And the readings and, and the books and everything like that have its place, but you're going to learn the most when you're interacting with founders, learning about their problems and how they engage with others and really just getting your hands dirty and, and doing the work. Yeah. What are some of the the biggest wins that you've had? And then I'm curious, what are some of the biggest challenges you've faced so far in your startup journey? Because I'm on the front end of things and yeah. I feel lucky that I've got a great team around me. It's a journey in and of itself, but I'm curious. That's why I was curious to have you or interested to have you on it. Want to hear from other founders and what it is that you're going through. Yeah, for sure. I think our best accomplishment to date is bringing together the team that we have now. We've had a few that have come through and made some contributions, but at the end of the day, it was the startup world wasn't for them. It's not that they didn't believe in the mission or anything like that. It was like they want to be in a more stable corporate type of environment, and which is fine. But yeah. what we like a group of people who are very talented in, in the realm of education, have done everything in education from teaching to administrators to school boards, et cetera. So that's been a really great thing to have the right people and bring your team together that work well together. That's a huge accomplishment. And then really building out that first iteration, that first MVP and testing it out. That was, that was a big thing, not only to, because I'm a non-technical founder, I can't code or, or do anything like that. So going out, building a, de a dev team, engaging with the dev team, and having that end product of, we did the UI UX, we've built it, we've tested it. Now it's ready for users and actually going and getting those users, engaging them and getting that feedback and then deciding, is this the correct route to go or do we need to pivot? And making those decisions and engaging in that process has been rewarding. It's a challenge for sure, 
but it's an accomplishment that's worthy of celebration to a certain extent. But beyond that, it's like, what's next? It, it, I don't want to say we, we failed in that first, first iteration, but we learned a lot. And that puts us on a trajectory to where we want to go, to where we fit better than where our first assumptions were. Yeah. And then I guess the, the biggest challenge is it's raising money. It, it, it's keeping, being on the funding trail, engaging with angels. We have a great group of angels who, who supported us from day one. And that's always a challenge, whether you're in ideation or in startup or whether you're in series A, that's uh, because what it, it takes you away from your business, right? It takes you away from the day-to-day -day operations. And, and there's different that we try and do and, and continuously engage our, our angels and our network. And we've luckily been able to keep ourselves afloat through angel investments because we're not VC ready. That's a whole nother kind of realm of fundraising. And so that's been a challenge, but something that we've, we've overcome and, and continue to overcome. And like you said, you can't, you know, engage your dev, dev team with zero dollars in the bank account. That's not, not how this that's not how this game works. So that that's a huge challenge. And, and even with founders at the foundry, that's a lot of the conversations that we have. Oh, we need funding. Like you need capital, you need talent, and you need customers. That's those are the three things that you need in a, in a startup or in any business really. But in, in a startup, that's there's anything that you need is going to fall into those three categories. Yeah, I think you know I'm hearing you speak, and I'm like, oh, we speak the same language because I am not a technical mm -hmm. founder either. I'm a subject matter expert <clears throat> on commercial real estate, okay. but it's my, like I said, it's my team that are the te the technicians or, or technical founders. And yeah, there's a lot of learnings from it. I too have noticed that we've had some people trade in and out of our team and that's okay. But like you said, they just, the startup world is not for everybody. They want to go off and be the best at what it is they're doing within their current organization or move into something, like you said, a more corporate stable position. And that's fine. Everybody's got their own goals and ambitions and, you know, you wish them the best. And then the other thing I was thinking is the learnings or learning experience that you touched on my wrestling coach, when he knew that we were in high school, when he knew that we were going to get, it was going to be a tough match He'd say, he'd come up to us and say, now this is a learning experience. And then he'd send us out and it would be <laughs> a learning experience. So I'm likening, I've used a lot of the same dialogue or, or thoughts to myself and others that I'm talking with that you've just said, yeah, this is, this is great. Um, interesting. So you sit in an interesting position because you are at founders at the foundry and that is a community focused on founders. You are a founder yourself, and then you're at Intrepid Finance, and so you're talking to founders all day. I'm wondering if you could expand upon those three things. Yeah, sure. So Founders at the Foundry, I don't know if you've heard of Chris Hively. He is, he's the, he founded MapQuest back in the day. So I've, I've read his book, Build the Fort, and it's all about building startup communities. So he exited MapQuest, probably tremendous exit. And he got, he became obsessed with startup communities in terms of turning cities into startup communities. Currently he's in Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. I uh, was involved in, in the Boulder experiment. So he's a Techstars, I believe, one of the founders in Techstars. And I engaged him. It's great because he makes himself available. So when I started Founders of the Foundry, I wanted it to be, 100% founder led. I'm not here to sell you co-working space or get you to apply to an accelerator. It's we bring founders in, we talk about their business, where they're at, and really what's currently what is your challenge? What do you have to get over today, this week or this month in order to get you to the next stage? We have those conversations with the intent of let's bring together resources and see how can we help you out. How can I help you out as a founder through my journey? How can you help me out through your journey as a founder? And similar to the conversation we're having now, great things have come about from that. Even if it's just a founder sitting here in the think tank that I'm in now at the co-working space, just venting, that helps too. It's a, it can be a very lonely journey in, in this founder world, in the startup world. And just to have that kind of community and that kind of support is vital, in my opinion. And it's not 
I'm not, we're not trying to take over startup Cincinnati or anything like that. It's just, it's a compliment to all the great things that's happening in, in Cincinnati. 1819 is, is doing absolutely phenomenal work. And it's just taking that and capitalizing off of that kind of separate from everything else to where founders can come and engage with each other, talk about where they're at and, and really just have that small community that's here to stay. And we're gathering resources in terms of, of financing. We want to engage the Ohio, Ohio Angel Collective. And then I've, in terms of Intrepid, I've had my eye on Intrepid for a while. A teammate of mine or a uh, classmate of mine from college, he, Intrepid, I would say it's a startup. They've been around a couple of years, but I always had my eye on them because it was, they focus on non-dilutive capital, right? And access to growth capital. So it's all about preserving equity. And I, and I preach that with my team at Engage With. I preach it with founders here that come through Founder at Foundry. Preservation of equity. Preserve equity for yourself, your team members, and your early investors, right? My nightmare scenario is a founder has this great idea, builds the company, generates revenue, is, a, is in the process of being acquired, and then he finds out after it's all said and done that he owns like 4 or 5% of the company that he started. Like that's a nightmare scenario. So but giving founders the opportunity to access capital that's not angel-based or venture capital-based, maybe it's a small project as in I have to build this feature for it's going to cost me 50 grand to build this feature. Maybe I can do it through debt financing or non-dilutive capital or things like that. And then also it's can we design products that are maybe there's a, a group of angels that pool their money together. And they loan money with intent of, hey, I'll give you 25000 You can pay off this loan. Maybe it gets down to ten, and we convert it to equity, right? Or things like that. Just giving more options for founders to use, take them off the funding trail a little bit so they can stay engaged in their business. And also while continually providing them access to capital as well. And in the same, at the same time, you're building up your startup business's credit as well, which helps you get into the big banking world as well. So bringing that in to founders at the Foundry, and like you said, engaging with founders and CEOs all day in that regard, just compounds your learning different businesses, different founders' journeys, how we can help you in, in financing, you know, the traditional way, the non dilutive the revenue-based financing way. That's what brings it all together. So you have, this not only helps me ideate on ways I can raise funds and funding for Engage With, but it helps me bring in funding for other founders that come through Founders at the Foundry and just build upon those resources um, and maybe even start a fund here that leverages those things as well. And working with Intrepid and, and the CEO, Steve Iskander, he's been great to learn from. And really being a CEO at a startup and then actually working for, for a company too at the same time, it, it's really been unique because you get to see a CEO who's been through it. He started a company, he sold, he sold a company, and now he's a serial entrepreneur. So to be able to see his leadership style and how he does things has just been a tremendous learning opportunity, not just for onboarding to Intrepid, but how you can conduct yourself and, and different strategies to use for my team as well, being a CEO. The different hats that we're putting on, it's always great to be exposed to things like that. And it, it's just been, it's just been wonderful to connect all three of these ventures or all three of these ideas together. And they're working very harmoniously together at this time. So it's been great. Yeah, that's fascinating. I've, I think I have seen in learning commercial real estate, I've taken a lot of learnings from what my clients have done well and what they've done not so well. And right. so you can take those lessons and say, all right, let's do something like this. Let's make the best units in the market and we'll have the best tenants. And, or you can say, I don't want to do this, uh, parachute into a market that I have no knowledge or experience and be undercapitalized. Mm -hmm. You get to learn the do's and don'ts from somebody else. And then when you're, you're in it now, but for me, I, I was like, all right, now I'm ready. I can jump into the ownership side of things and not just brokering deals. And I've been able to take those learnings and apply them appropriately. So that's awesome. That's yeah, really what, great. What, what was your I'm ready moment for needle, right? Or, or that was there an aha moment or was this kind of, I've seen this opportunity or I've had this in the back of my head for a while. Because I'm interested just because you've been in the industry that you're in and you're creating a startup in, which is common. 
And I, I'm just interested to see, like, when was that aha moment? Or was this kind of building up as, I wish I had this technology to do X. And you know what? I'm going to go build it. Yeah. So the I have been in brokerage in one capacity or another since 2008. And I've used various different CRM systems. And the one that I used for a majority of my career, it's not really supported anymore, but it was awesome because it had, it collected so many different data points and it was great. Like it had the feature to pull a match buyers list. If you had that, if you had the buyer's criteria, you could, when you had an opportunity, you could click a button and it would give you like a hot list of prospective buyers. And that was awesome. And then would capture all the sales data as long as you plugged it in manually, unfortunately. And so it had all these insights that it provided, but it was pretty manually intensive. And th the other data platforms that are out there are great from the standpoint that they provide all the data. They're like encyclopedias of the commercial real estate market. And they kind of tout themselves on that, which is great. But the thought was, man, there's all this data out there, rental rates, occupancies, loan information. You can see who's buying and selling what, how long they've held it for. So what if you could use all this data and apply some analytics to predict which transactions are going to occur even before the owner knew that they were ready to sell? That was the ultimate hypothesis. And because what I found is in being a salesperson, you have a thousand, call it a thousand contacts in your database that you're calling on at varying intervals. And I had the occasion where I'd be talking with somebody doing what I thought was additive of value to the relationship. And yeah, no, we're not doing anything right now. I'm just holding tight. And then all of a sudden I'd see him either list a deal with a competitor or sell something, or they would buy something. And I was like, what? I just talked to that guy. What am I missing? So that's where the thought came in. And then Maher, my, my partner came to me and he said, Hey, my partners and I have a background in software. We want to buy value add real estate. And I was like, that's great. But what about this? And I pitched him. What if you could use data and analytics to predict real estate transactions before they occur? And he said, let me go think about it. And I think the next week we got together for lunch. The three of us are now founding partners and they're like, yeah, this thing has legs. And I was like, all right, great. I was a little more enthusiastic than that, but I was so excited that somebody was like, yeah, I think we can do that because commercial real estate is slow to adopt technologies. And I had been talking about it with some other folks, ah, that'll never work sort of thing. And I was like, yeah, I, I disagree. I think it will. That's and, the easy answer, isn't it? That'll never work. Or... Yeah. And it's taken a lot of work to get to where we're at presently. And it will continue to take a lot of work to get it to where we want to take it. But it's like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? That's right. We started building, we started the, let's see if we can prove the hypothesis. So I have a team of data scientists and engineers, and they would give me like an Excel spreadsheet of say 20 properties to go call on. And what would happen is that of the 20 deals, seven or eight of them would be in play one way or the other. Like we were valuing it. It was listed by us or a competitor. It was under contract. Like it was somehow in play. And I was like, oh man, we're onto something. And we did it across multiple markets. And I had my friends throughout the industry help us test it out. And time and again, that was the case. So it's, oh, we're definitely onto something. Our initial thought was we can just plug in to a brokerage shop and use their data and apply our models and help them fast forward against their competition. And data is the fuel that runs commercial real estate. And that was not going to happen. Nobody was going to turn over their data set to us and let us use it and then give them leads out of it. 
So we said, all right, we got to go back to the drawing board. And we went and sourced a data source and have been either, you might say, ironing it out or sewing it together, whatever analogy you want to use. But we've got access to every single parcel record throughout the United States. But it's a, right now it's a complicated thing because you can have a deal that is, say, 120 units, but it is built in across three different parcels. And so you've got 40 units here, 40 units here, 40 units here. How do you sew that together to create one property record? Or we're going to be bringing a deal to market where it is all individually parceled. It's 130 units. And so how do you recognize that and sew it together? I think it's the best analogy, actually. So we're in the process of getting that figured out. And I think we're pretty close. And then once we do that, we can start to monetize. But we've went through the same beta testing process that you mentioned and have taken those learnings and have been able to make alterations to the platform and make it better, make the user interface and user experience better. One of the things was, it's great that you can move it forward through the pipeline, a deal forward through the pipeline. But if I get in touch with somebody and they say they're not doing anything and it still sits there in the lead set, pretty soon I'm going to have a top end of prospecting leads full of not interested. Mm -hmm. And so what we figured out was that it was just as important to be able to get rid of deals that aren't interested in transacting as it is to be able to move them forward through the pipelines. Long answer to your question, I think, but that's where it came from, where it started and where we're at today. No, that's great. Cause it, it's very similar. I wouldn't exactly call yours a, a pivot cause you're still like on the same trajectory, yeah. but it's, you had a, you at least at the very least you tested your theory and verified your thesis and, and that's huge in and of itself. Are we chasing rabbits here or are we actually onto something? And I think you confirmed that through the work that you just explained. So that's fantastic. And, and a step that sometimes people the founders in general skip. They're like, my idea is great. It's going to save the world and I'm just going to build it. And yeah. they build it, they spend all this money and there's no customer or, or some of their assumptions were wrong. And now 40% of their platform is useless or has to be replaced. And that's how a lot of founders kind of, one, lose they lose trust in, from their investors because you just burned through 250K to build something that wasn't needed. So yeah, that's that's a great work in like the, the launching of your startup and launching of your idea. And, and those are the stories that we hear all the time at, at Founders at the Foundry. And what's great is the students coming out of university, whether that's UC, Miami, Northern Kentucky University, or any of the universities around here, they are they have so much entrepreneur energy and they're starting, like I mentioned earlier, like there was no entrepreneurship major or anything like that, or course in uh, when we were in school. And now that they, they're they going through these four or five year programs, some are have businesses that they've started in school. Some have products that they've built at, through UC's program, through their DAP program, and they're coming out ready to go. So it's like, how can we capitalize on this entrepreneurial energy that's coming out from the younger generation and take what we've learned the hard way and apply it to them. And at the same time, they're teaching us as well, some of the new things that they're coming out with, the ideas and the energy that they're coming out with as well. And that that's what our EdTech platform, Engage With, focuses on when we talk about mentorship. Mentorship, the old traditional mentorship is, you're my mentor, I'm your mentee, you possess all the knowledge and you're passing it down to me. That's the old kind of mentorship model. And in the new age kind of model, it's, this is a mutual relationship, right? You have 10 years experience. I'm in my first year experience. Uh, you have knowledge. I have knowledge. Let's interact on the same level. And you're going to grow in your skills and your experience. I'm going to grow in my skills and my experience. And we're going to do this together in a mutual relationship, not so much I'm above you or you're above me and I'm passing down all the knowledge. And what I say is pretty much gospel. That's what we're, that's what we're trying to build that atmosphere through the platform with engage with and build that dynamic, uh, especially in the, in education specific to an individual teacher's classroom, specific to the learning environment that they're operating in and that they've created. 
we say we're disrupting the professional development world in education. And really, if you we've talked to hundreds, not thousands of teachers, and they go through their professional development seminars, and it's somebody, we're going to get together in a conference room, they're going to go through a PowerPoint presentation on X topic, and we hear it all the time from educators. The topics that we go to in these professional development seminars very rarely have anything to do with our particular learning environment or our particular classroom. Sometimes it does, but then the actual implementation from the PD to the classroom is not there. That's the pain point right there. That's support. And we call it empowering educators because right now, the way the education system is set up, it's very administrative heavy. Since 2000, the number of administrators in the system has grown by 88%. And the number of teachers has grown by like 4% in 20 years. Teachers are bombarded with admin and projects and everything like that, which poses another challenge in the ed tech world. Okay, we've got this brand new ed tech product. It's going to revolutionize education. To implement that into a classroom is another project on top of whatever the teachers are already doing on top of the three other ed tech platforms that they have on there, on top of the disruptive classroom or whatever the, the plethora of challenges that teachers face is just another challenge for introducing a new ed tech platform. So what we want to do with Engage With is every time that you're on the platform and engaging in the platform, it's you're being developed professionally, right? It's not we're sitting in a seminar and we're going to look at this presentation and, and maybe we'll take some tidbits and maybe it'll make it into the classroom. No, it's I'm going onto the platform. This is the specific situation I'm dealing with right now. Your mentor can engage with you on that. And we're using AI similar to how you're using AI, not similar, but you're using artificial intelligence on your platform. We're incorporating it into our platform. And what we want to do with that is, is really build cases in terms of I had a disruptive student, mentor comes in, hey, here's some strategies to deal with a group of disruptive students. I implement those strategies into my learning environment. I come back, I update the situation. AI creates a case. And now we have a case for a specific situation tied to a specific classroom. And now when, whether that teacher's in North Carolina, here in Ohio, San Francisco, New York, wherever they are in the country, classroom problems are very similar, right? They're, a lot of teachers are going to have the same issues, whether that's a disruptive classroom or not. So now... When the case was created in Ohio and a teacher in New York has that same issue, now there's a case already made. Like, hey, this is similar to the case in Ohio. Let's pull in the strategies that they use and evaluate those. Okay, I implemented this. Now, I when I implemented, these were the results. So now you can see this case is building with different iterations. And now we have this kind of valuable library of cases of <clears throat> all these situations and implementations throughout the country in either classroom, but they're very specific and targeted to individual learning environments. And when I say individual learning environments, what I'm basically saying is individual educators. So that's how we're empowering educators by giving them the arena to improve and update and experiment with the learning environments that they're creating. It's interesting. It's like the saying, as you're speaking, I'm like, oh, it's like history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. That's like the the lesson that you're articulating, I think. And mm -hmm. side note, I was that disrupted student. <laughs> I'm sure I was too as well. I was not a very good student and I, and I didn't particularly enjoy school at all. And here I am working in, in education. So it's a full circle type of thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That, that sounds great. And it's a yeah. Cause otherwise you're like sitting there racking your brain. Oh, what do I do? And you're limited to only what you can come up with or what your immediate peers can come up with. But if you can take learnings from somebody either in the next town or across the country, how they've dealt with the similar thing, that is a way to fast forward, which is awesome. Exactly. And it's, it can be down the road. We think it can be, we started in student teaching and now, and now we've gone into the novice teacher realm, like I explained earlier, but it's at some point when you hit that critical mass, the, the greatest educator development tool in these college of education is the student teaching experience. So we can build a, a system to where we're developing educators through using these cases, exposing them to these cases and doing that in a relatively efficient way. When you go into your student teaching, you're 
ready to go. I'm not saying that colleges of ed and the classes that that are involved in your undergraduate degree aren't valuable, but everybody knows that the most learnings that you do as an undergrad preparing to be an educator is under your student teaching in the student teaching realm, right? Under a mentor teacher where you're going into their classroom, you're actually teaching their class under their tutelage. We want to expand on that to get to that first year, to get them past that third year and really get those a, a core group of, of educators that are coming up that are going to stay in education and advance education to the new heights that we need to go to. Because right now, uh, as you probably know, our education system is is crumbling pretty yeah. rapidly. I read an article just the other day about, I think it was in Baltimore, even in Chicago, there, there are some schools who every student that walks through the doors of that school is not reading at their, is not reading at their grade level, is not doing math at their grade level. And to me, that's unacceptable, right? And to, to a lot of people, that's unacceptable. And the challenges in those schools are, are apparent, obviously, um, but it's not to say that they're impossible to overcome. And that's not a fight worth fighting, right? Let's fight this fight because this is very important. Our future depends on it. Our, the future of our youth depends on it. And education is the key to making that happen. Yeah. It's interesting as you were speaking, something occurred to me where there's a crossover between my brokerage practice and the education industry. You might say, I don't know. Property taxes are a big line item in commercial real estate deals. And I was talking with a client I don't know, a month or two ago, and he's, my tax bill has increased by 4X. But if you look at the school, and I'll leave the, the school district unnamed, he's, it hasn't improved by 4X. So it things like what you're doing hopefully could improve school systems and help them get those learnings so that that sentiment isn't there. And then the other thing I was thinking about what you guys are doing, you can create case studies out of that, which is exactly what you're doing. And then that's content that you can push out as a way to continue to drive customers to your platform and keep your existing customers engaged, which is genius. It's great. Yeah. And and I love that the, we're in this like AI revolution, if you will. It feels like back in the mid nineties when the internet was just coming online and you were still getting those AOL discs in the mail, try the, <laughs> the week or the month long for free. And everybody was like, what is this internet? How do we use it? What is it? Is this going to take over all the jobs and, and everything like that? It's the same questions that we're asking about AI that we were asking about when the, the internet came online to the majority of the masses, right? And it's like everybody, that, that same fear. We were young at the time, but it's that same fear you see in people like, oh, AI is going to take every single job. It might take some jobs, but at the same time, when Back in the early 90s, we had no idea what a social media manager was or right. social media in general. And that whole a whole industry was created off of that one aspect of the internet. And I think that's what AI has the potential of doing. And those who take advantage of that and get in early, we're not looking for another dot-com bubble. But in theory, that's probably what's going to happen. You're going to have these astronomical valuations some, for some of these AI companies. And some of them are going to turn into, what is it, like pets.com or whatever it was. One of the big ones that was worth a billion dollars and then it's you know worth zero. But that's the growth of new technology and people taking chances and overvaluations and things like that. I think that's what the arena we're playing in right now when we talk about AI. And I think it's extremely exciting. I was a little too young to be a part of the, the first wave. And it seems like this is our opportunity to capitalize on the next wave, which, which could even be bigger than the internet in and of itself. Yeah, I think technologies like what you're building and what we're building, we don't envision it as, well, we, just, we look at it as a tool to be able to help professionals do their job better. And will it replace some? Sure. But it's who needs a buggy whip today? Nobody needs a buggy whip, right? Who needs a slide ruler? Mm -hmm. Nobody needs a slide ruler. But you have technologies that have replaced those things and replaced those jobs with, just like you said, social media didn't even exist when AOL yeah. and AIM was out. And yeah, it's a 
social media influencers. Think about that. That's a whole job in yeah. us. Yep, exactly. That's a great. <laughs> yeah, Podcast. so I, I, I think it'll open up a whole new category of things that we can't even imagine right now. Or some people might be able to, but I can't. <laughs> You're doing a good job so far with the AI implementation and really just learning about it. Because it even feels like the the programmers and the computer scientists and you have your absolute experts in, in artificial intelligence, but even those engineers are like, yeah, we're still trying to figure out how great this can be or the dangers even of, of AI and, and building things out like this. So it, it's phenomenal time to be alive and be in, the, in, in this kind of world, the startup world, the AI world, the development world, the technology world. And uh, man, it, it, the next decade is going to be very interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like we started on this long enough ago where we're coming to fruition right as this AI wave is taking place. And I feel like we're timed really well for it. So I'm excited mm-hmm. for what the future has to bring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. It's timing can be everything. And, and I think, like you said, we're on that wave of going up. Yeah. Yeah. If founders or educators or administrators want to get in touch with you for the two, the multiple hats that, that you wear, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. LinkedIn is always a good place to, to start. Reach out on LinkedIn, connect on LinkedIn. Kevin Harnest is, is where you can find me there. And just through email, um, Kevin at engagewit.org, E-N-G-A-G-E-W-I-T.org. That's my email address. And like I said, we love to do to engage with founders at any stage, whether you're you know building your platform, whether you think you have an idea of something to build. We love to engage. We love to have those conversations. Um, we have founders connections, open invitations to founders connections. It's really just you know set a date that works best for you. Come out here to Liberty Township and in the Liberty Center at Elevate Office Suites. We sit down. We have a great conversation to see where we're at, see where we can help you and really go from there. So you can start on the right foot and build that trajectory. And I'm a huge believer in building momentum. And if you can get momentum going in in those first early stages, it can really really accelerate you to to something great. But yeah, those two avenues are the best way to, uh, to reach out to me. That's awesome. Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You do as well. I appreciate you having me. Okay.